Lamentations, we pick up Jeremiah, where Babylon had left off. You gotta understand a place as Judah and Jerusalem, the size of Rhode Island, New Jersey, Maryland, or even Ohio. You understand what Jeremiah is writing in the book of Lamentations is after the fact. And you're not talking about a tornado that come and hit a home. You're not talking about a hurricane that came and wiped out a neighborhood. You're talking about utter judgment by God upon what in American terms would be an entire state. Imagine waking up tomorrow morning and the news would be New York City is destroyed. No. Wake up tomorrow morning, New York is destroyed. If it can burn or melt, it has turned to ashes or it has turned to goo. If it's rock, cement, or anything like that, it is rubble. You're talking about absolute, unbelievable destruction of what we would call a state. Judah and Jeremiah, uh, Judah and Jerusalem are the main, the capital of all Israel. This is the meeting house where they, the Jews, were to meet God. And the temple in Lamentations is gone. Nehemiah tells us that the rubble he couldn't even walk through, him or the beast that he's writing upon. It's destroyed. Babylon has done an excellent job of destroying this area, this city, and this temple. And we are in Lamentations chapter 1, an eyewitness account to the destruction by Jeremiah. Lamentations is also a hymn. It's a hymnal of sorrow. How does the city, Jerusalem, sit solitary? That's the present condition to Jeremiah. That was full of people. That's the past of Jeremiah. Jerusalem was a city that they were to go to the men three times a year. It was the fulcrum and the central point of the worship of God. It's even the place that Jesus will be. How is she become a widow? She that was great among the nations and princesses, princess among the provinces. How is she become a tributary? taxes she collected wealth from all nations now she's paying and we'll see that more and more in lamentation it was once but now she weepeth sore in the night and her tears are on her cheeks among all her lovers she had none to comfort her Tears on her cheeks mean she's crying now. She's in sorrow. She's in lamentation. And even in life, you'll probably find those lovers, those people that really cared about you. And when you're in your misery, when you're in your trouble, where are they? Where is the Queen of Sheba? Where are all the nations that turn? Her away from God to their gods. Where is the relationships? Where is the love? And there are people out there hearing this message by saying, Yeah, I felt that. All her friends have dwelt treachery with her. Friends are ones that you choose. Friends are supposed to be stronger than family because family you can't choose. You're born into it. But friends are people you choose. And you've chosen these people 
and they have turned not to be friends. They have turned to be enemies, as Judas did. They are become her enemies. You're not to put your faith in human man. You are to put your faith in the man Christ Jesus. Because any man, human being, can defile you. Judah is going into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. Going to Babylon. She dwells among the heathen. They're in Babylon. She findeth no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. The ways of Zion do mourn. Because none come to the solemn feast. Those were the three feasts every year that the men were to come. They're not coming no more. We're told by Jeremiah it's going to be 70 years. Seventy years. Two hundred and ten missed feasts that God said you must. And it will not. All her gates are desolate. All her gates are destroyed. In Nehemiah, you, re you read how they got to be rebuilt. Her priests sigh, those that weren't killed, that we read about in Jeremiah 52. They're signing. They're looking. They're looking at this rubble, saying, "That's where we used to work. That's where we were supposed to worship God." Her virgins are afflicted. No one to marry. She is in bitterness. Pictures Job. I mean, think about it. We, we, in our times, have seen many newscasts of a tornado that has hit, and we see the pictures and the family looking, and the only thing standing is a fireplace. And yet, a lot of times, and I don't want to be cruel, I don't want to be mean or anything, but a lot of times you don't read about deaths, you don't hear about deaths, but here, there is death. There is loneliness. There is destruction. Her adversaries are the chief. Those that were against her, now they're in charge. Her enemies prosper. They've taken from her. They spoiled her. All the brass, the gold, and the silver that we read about last night from the house of God is in Babylon. Belshazzar is going to drink and party with them. They had destroyed the king's house, we read in chapter 52. All his goods are in Babylon. They destroyed all the houses. All their goods are parted among the soldiers of the Chaldean. For the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Get that. Get that. For the Lord has afflicted her. For the multitude of her transgressions. God, you can't say, you know, it was an act of God. That won't go for an insurance policy of, of Jerusalem and Judah. It wasn't an act of God. It was an act of transgression, sins, and iniquity. What causes those tornadoes and those hurricanes to come? The wages of sin is death. But yet, oh, an act of God. No, an act of your own rebellion, my friend. Her children are going into captivity before the enemy. They're in the enemy's hands, being their captives. And for the daughter of Zion, all her beauty is departed. You imagine what that place looked like. Have you read the description when, when Solomon built that place? Can you imagine that place when the sun rises? In Jerusalem, how that place it must have just glowed, how that place must have just sparkled all the way down to sunset. And now, you know what you see? You know what Jeremiah is seeing? He's seen smoke in various places. 
He seen corpse turn blue, starting to stink, pus balls blurping and gooping, and a stink. People in rags running around filthy, crying, nowhere to go. And from the door's iron, her, all her beauty is departed. Her princes are become like hearts that have no pasture, skinny and dead. And they are gone without strength before the pursuer. Some of them are taken. They're taken by force. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and of her miseries all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old. Gold and silver. It spoke about the time of Solomon. Silver was just like a rock. When her people fell into the heart, when the people fell into the hand of the enemy, and none did help her. Now you keep on trusting the friends that don't trust the Lord. You keep on trusting in family that don't trust the Lord. Don't you think in hard times they're going to be there for you? Matter of fact, they just may become your enemies. They even may mock you. Where's your God? Huh? Where's your Jesus? We don't suffer. We don't have the problems you have. You better have your faith and trust in one man. The man Christ Jesus when it's all gone through. You know, Job really didn't get angry until his three friends show up. Before those three friends showed up, I mean, he was telling his wife, he was telling everyone around, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, but I'm going to do right by the Lord. As soon as those three friends show up, your three friends may show up in your life, and guess what? They may cause you to blaspheme God. The adversary saw her and did mock at her Sabbath. Hey, yeah, that one day you give to the Lord. Honor the Sabbath. Don't do any work. What work can you do now, Jerusalem? Where are your vineyards? Where are your orchards? Where is your temple? Where is the baker? Where is the guy that makes the shrines? Where is the guy that makes those molten images? You know what we didn't read in Jeremiah 52? We read all the stuff that was in the temple, right, that went to Babylon. Did you read about any molten images? Did you read any statues? Did you read any of the gods? I didn't read any of those. I didn't read about the craftsmen. Those were absent in Jeremiah 52. Jerusalem has grievously sinned. That's the problem. Why did this hurricane hit this land? Sin. Why did these tornadoes go? Sin. Why did these blo Sin. Why did my baby? The wages of sin. Therefore she is removed. She's gone. For 70 years. All that honored her despised her. Well, look at that. All they that you thought are not thinking, because they have seen her nakedness. They seen what she really was. What was she really? She was a city built for gods and not God. We read about churches and, and worship in all the streets, like in America. She sighed and turned it backward. She ain't gonna go forward. God's against her. 52 chapters of Jeremiah told us that. Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembers not her last end. Therefore she, she came down wonderfully. She came down. You know where Jonah went? He went down. She had no comforter. The Holy Spirit's our comforter. You know when all the people forsake you, as a born again Bible believing Christian, you can have the comforter to comfort you. O oh Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself. Of course he has. God told you he was going to do it, because you never repented. The adversary has spread out his hand upon all her pleasant things, for she has seen that the heathen entered into her sanctuary. 
I told you. Remember I told you? Babylon went into the temple. Were they allowed there? One king got turned into leprosy just for offering his incest inside the, the holy place. Uh, John the Baptist's father got all upset when, when this angel shows up in where no other man was supposed to be. Babylon went to a place it wasn't supposed to be. And we read about two chapters of the fall of Babylon because they did things they weren't supposed to. Number one, they cursed God's people. They didn't have to. Number two, they entered into the sanctuary of God, which they were not supposed to do. Listen, the Philistines had diseases and mice when they handled the Ark of God. That's just for handling the Ark of God. And they put him in the house of Dagon, and look what happened to Dagon. He lost his arms and his, and his head, literally. And the heathen enter in sanctuary, whom thou didst command that they should not enter into thy congregation. But they did. And the only thing they did not get was the Ark of the Covenant. God took that. All her people sighed. They seek bread. They have given their pleasant things for meat to relieve the soul. You know what verse 11 is? If you don't know, they go into the pawn shop. And they are pawning their stuff to get food. They are hungry. They are miserable. And what Babylon has not taken, and they've taken the best thing. The worst things that they got, they are trying to get money for them so they can eat. Didn't you read in the Bible and in the prophets? They sold their children for shoes. They sold their sons for wine. O oh Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by, everyone going by the caravan? Behold and see, that there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord has afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. Come well, everybody, look at you that are traveling by me, look at me. Look at what I'm doing. Look what has God done to me. The wrath of God. Sounds like the news media. From above he has sent fire into my bones, and prevaileth against them. He has spread a net for my feet, a trap, a snare. He has turned me back. He has made me desolate and faint all the day. Now can you find me those places in Jeremiah that we studied? You know, if you were to go back and take the 52 chapters that we studied in Jeremiah, and write down wherever Jeremiah said that this was coming. Remember sword, famine, desolation. You write those down. How many times did Jeremiah warn them? The yoke of my transgressions is bound by his hand. They were tied to sin. Sin became their harness. And Jesus said, cast your burdens upon me. Take of my yoke. They are wreathed. That's you know a wreath. It's round. And come up upon my neck. He had made my strength to fall. Not uplift, fall. The Lord has delivered me into their hand, the enemy. From whom I am not able to rise up. You're not going to get up. You're down. The Lord has trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. The army. Remember the young guys. The strength. The power. They're dead. They're gone. Isaiah 63.3. Revelation 14.19. 19.15. He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. Don't you think you're going to have an army and defeat everybody without God? That verse tells you in verse 15, you cannot have the most powerful navy. You can't have the most powerful marines. 
You can't have the most advanced Air Force. You cannot have drones. You cannot have a SEAL team. You cannot have the elite of the league. And without God, you ain't got nothing. The Lord has trodden the virgin daughter of Judah. As in a wine press. Now, where do you see that reference? That reference is likened to the second advent of the enemies of God. These are the people of God who have gone against God, likened to be pressed under underfoot. You wait till when God deals with the enemy. If he's done it to his people, you better believe he'll do it to those people that are not his. For these things I weep. My eye, my eye runneth down with water, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. Notice how these all in the first person pronoun. Jeremiah is stepping from speaking for the city to speaking about himself. My children are desolate. Now, he didn't have no children. He wasn't married, but his brethren. Because the enemy prevailed. Zion spreads forth her hand. There is none to comfort her. Come on, anybody help me. America's going to realize one day that the medical field, that she, they're going to comfort their hands out to them. They're not going to get, where's your money? Well, you ain't got no more money. Well, you ain't got no more help. Help me. Come on, government. Give me some more money. We ain't got, we're in a debt. We're double digit trillion debt. How can we help you? Help me. The Lord has commanded concerning Jacob. That his adversary should be round about him. Jerusalem is a menstruous woman among them. An unclean woman. If you go back and check the law. Even her husband couldn't lie with her. And anything that anybody that touched anything she touched. Was considered unclean. And there are island nations that when a woman has reached this time of the month. They have special huts for them. They are separated from the group of people. Jerusalem is separated. She's unclean. She's bloody. The Lord is righteous. For I have rebelled against his commandment. Now she's starting to acknowledge. After all the destruction. After all the diseases come. Oh, I'll get right later on in life. Yeah, when you got all the diseases, you got all the troubles, you got all the problems, you got all the, the, the baggage on, the, on your back, and you've you got all the stuff in your life that has been miserable, and how can God use you later on? Get right now. I pray you all people, behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men are gone into captivity. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach. In the dark. Guess where they are right now? As Jeremiah is writing this. They have been welcomed into Babylon. And you might even be able to pick up Daniel chapter 1 from here. I think it may give you a little a couple years or something. But this is about a little bit around this time. Maybe a little bit later just writing. This is when Daniel 1 is written. I call for my lovers, but they deceive me. Look at that. They didn't really love you. You know, if a man is without God, he's without love. Because the Bible says God is love. And if you don't know God, you don't know what love is. And you think that anybody who stands up before a man and a woman and a woman and a man and say, what God has joined together, let no man... You really think God joined that unsaved couple or that unsaved and that saved person? You really think somebody's without God, that God is going to honor something, that they don't even know what love is because God is love and they don't know God? You're a fool to believe that. Yes, God sanctions marriages and all that, but come on. You got two people or one person who doesn't even know who God is. And you goes, I love you. Really? You can't say that. Because you are of your father the devil. And read John 8, 44. But they deceived me. That's Satan's side. Who deceives? Does God deceive? 
My priests and my elders gave up the ghosts in the city, dead. While they sought their meat to relieve their soul. They died of malnutrition. So what about all those people who are dying in other cities and other countries? They're dying, they have no food. Sin. Especially those nations that grandma and grandpa and mom and pop are cows. They're not dying of hunger. There's a bunch of hamburgers running around them. They're dying because they worship those hamburgers as gods. Now they turn those gods into food. They will live. But because those are their gods, they are dying. Behold. O oh Lord, I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. You ever have a time in your life, and maybe it's just me, I don't know. You know, you really get this sincere, it's a true scare in your life. I remember one night when I was in, in the trailer, I woke up to the smell of smoke. You know, places on fire. You get that, you know, maybe you stepped out in front of a car, you didn't know it was coming. That scare. That's what it is right now. It's a sensation. It's hard to describe. My bowels are troubled. My heart is turned within me. For I have grievously rebelled. She's starting to acknowledge her sins. Or Jeremiah is doing it for the city. Jeremiah, like Daniel, is repenting for the nation. Aboard the sword, bereaveth. At home there is at home there is as death. The people are dying in the city and the sword is killing them outside the city. Like we saw King Zedekiah. He escapes but is caught and dies in prison. His sons die in front of his eyeballs before they're plucked out. I have heard that I sigh. There is none to comfort me. God has turned her back. All my enemies had heard my trouble. Wasn't there, wasn't there the, the Babylonian guy that came, I forget which chapter, came from Jeremiah and said, we're doing this because of your sins? That Babylonian guy knew more about God than the Hebrews knew about their God. They are glad that thou hast done it. Edomites, Esau. Moabites, all those chapters we read against them. When we come to Obadiah, as he speaks against Esau, I believe it's Obadiah. I keep saying Obadiah, and I may be wrong. Thou hast done it. Thou, thou will bring the day that thou hast called. What is that verse? What is that particular part of the sentence called? The day that thou hast called. What is that? That is all of Jeremiah. Even the heathen knew what God was going to do. And they shall be like unto me. Listen, you got a child who's in a righteous family growing up. They ought not be surprised they're going to get paddled for, for lying or anything. They ought to expect it. And then they cry, oh, why did you do this to me? Here, go write Jeremiah in Lamentation, then tell me why it, it happened to you. Because of your transgressions. And everybody around you know it's wrong. Let all their wickedness come before thee. Now the enemies are saying this to destroy Jerusalem. I mean, when I say destroy Jerusalem, I mean just wipe it off the map, wipe the Jews off the map, and give it to the, the, the Ishmaelites. And then let them battle with the Middle Easterns, and let them battle with the Jordanites, and let them battle with everybody else who wants the land. But that's not going to happen. And do unto them as thou hast, hast done unto me, for all my transgressions, for my sighs are many, and my heart is faint. And that's just one chapter. We've got four more to go of an eyewitness of the daily Jerusalem, of the destruction of Jer uh, Jerusalem 
by a prophet of God who is completely a prophet of God because everything he has said has come to place, has happened, and now he's sitting back and writing after the fact.